Thank you guys for joining us for session three in the Dietary Patterns in Health and Disease Feeding Our Microbiota. We hope you'll join us for our final session, December 2nd, Guide to Home Fermentation. Today's in-service is brought to you by our multi-state team from the University of Florida. We have Dr. Wendy Dahl with the Food Science and Human Nutrition Department, Julie England, Extension Agent Emeritus, Kendra Zamoyski, Regional Specialized FCS Agent, and I'm Wendy Lynch, Extension Agent in Putnam County. From Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, Dr. Carlin Rathie with the Department of Human Nutrition, Foods, and Exercise. And from North Dakota State University, Dr. Julie Garden Robinson with the Department of Health, Nutrition, and Exercise Sciences. For those participating in the live session today, a certificate of attendance will be available to you at the end of the Qualtrics evaluation that will be sent after today's event. All sessions are being recorded and will be emailed to those registered but unable to attend. And if you enjoy the session, please share it with your, uh, the IST with your coworkers. They still have time to attend for that final session if they register. Not that anyone probably needs any guidance on Zoom features, but real quickly, um, where you are viewing today's presentation, you may have to hover over the page to get your tool options to pop up, including the chat box. So once you see that chat icon, go ahead and click on that. And from here, you'll see the two option. And using that drop down menu, you can either send your comments and questions to all participants and panelists or privately to the panelists. A quick disclaimer um, the information provided is for educational purposes only. Reference to a commercial product does not constitute an endorsement by the webinar team members or their institutions. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Wendy Dahl. Dr. Dahl is an Associate Professor of Nutritional Sciences and a Nutrition Extension Specialist with the Food Science and Human Nutrition Department at the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. She holds a PhD in Nutrition from the University of Saskatchewan, Canada. Dr. Dahl leads research examining the effects of fiber, prebiotics, and probiotics on gastrointestinal health and disease. And without further ado, Dr. Dahl. Thank you very much, Wendy, for the introduction. So it is my pleasure today to talk to you about really my favorite hot topic, diet and the microbiome. So first, um, before I begin, I would like to disclose that I've received research, recent research funding as principal and co-investigator related to the microbiota um, from the NIH, USDA, Saskatchewan Pulse Growers, Lalamont Health Solutions, and the Almond Board of California. I have one primary objective today, to describe how foods, nutrients, and dietary patterns impact the microbiota and health. Well, the microbiota and its connection to health is complex. Today we will be discussing bacteria, but we know that fungi and um, viruses are also important to health. Early studies have mostly examined the microbiota at the phylum level, so that is the, the um, highest level. Um, and they've looked at the ratio of the two most abundant phyla um, with the hope of thinking that or finding a clear link to health, specifically the ratio of the, the two main phyla, the Firmicutes and the Bacteroides. However, there are so many different bacteria belonging to each phyla, some with benefit, some that may pose harm. So it's really difficult to decipher those clear connections between the phyla health and disease. And so what many studies have also looked at is the diversity of micro, microorganisms. That's the variability or richness of microbes. Um, and, and that diversity is thought to maintain the stability of the microbiota, posing less chance of dysbiosis, what, um, which is the disruption of balance of the microbiota. And if you attended Dr. Archer's um, uh, session one, he talked quite a bit about dysbiosis. So yes, diversity seems to be lower, for instance, in some older adults, but not all. And it's lower in some diseases, disease states, but not others. Um, for example, a couple of years ago, we studied malnourished children in rural Africa that had a really poor diet. They really only um, consumed maize porridge every day, really um, not much di diet variety at all. And oddly, they had very high uh, diversity of other microbes. So again, it can depend on disease states. So diversity does not 
um, seem to be very responsive to dietary changes, which is unfortunate. Um, most studies nowadays examine the abundance of bacteria at the genus level and the relationship to those levels of bacteria at the genus level to health. Although some health effects are even more specific, they may be down to the species level or even strain specific. So this figure, this colorful figure, shows the top 20 genera of a group of healthy older adults. So they're, it's at the genus level. So each rectangle, rectangle is a person and each bar is a different sample. So note that at the bottom, if we look at the bottom two thirds of the, of the figure, the, the taxa, the genus are quite similar, but the top one third is quite variable. You can see this one here, this individual here has lots of the dark green bars, which is the bifidobacteria. This lady over here, these are all women, this lady over here has lots of lactobacillus. Um, and so you can see that even though the bottom two thirds are, are pretty constant from person to person, that top two third gives, gives us the different variability. So we really have a lot to learn as to what a healthful microbiota should look like. So there may also be what are known as microbiomarkers. These are certain microbes which are related to the severity of disease or to health. For example, Fecalibacterium prosnitzi is given lots of press. As in health, it is usually abundant. And it is one of those butyrate producers, which we will talk about a bit more in a few minutes, that Fecalibacterium prosnitzi is lower. It's found in lower levels in IBS, in IBD, in chronic kidney disease, and it also is affected by weight loss. Um, we can see in the microbiota example here, in this woman, that the genus fecal bacterium is quite high, making up about 15% of the total bacteria. However, bifidobacterium, also considered a health enhancing bacteria, doesn't even make the top 20 in this individual. So, Consuming food provides fermentable substrate, which sustains the micro microbial ecosystem in the colon. At least some foods do. Uh, this is not necessarily the case for ultra processed foods because they're so highly digestible. It seems that it takes major changes in the amount or ratio of carbohydrates, protein, and fat to be able to impact the microbiota. So we're just gonna take a quick look at the recommended range, ranges for macronutrients for nutrition and health. And they're recommended that um, 10 to 35% of energy should come from protein, 45 to 65% should come from, come from carbs, sorry, um, and 20 to 35% from fat. This first pie chart shows a typical, typical um, Western diet with about 50% of the calories from carbs, 15% from protein, and 35% from fat. If we look at the second um, pie chart though, um, protein is now at 30%. So people that are pushing high protein diets are approaching that level of protein. Fat is lower of course, and then carbohydrates is now down to um, really the lower cutoff at 45% of energy. Popular diets, which we will discuss in a few minutes, may fall out of these recommended percentages and impact the microbiota. So, so what exactly is going on in our fermentation tank, which is our colon? When we eat a typical diet, most of the carbohydrate we eat is digested, most of the starch and sugars, but some of the carbohydrate we eat escapes digestion. This includes all of the fiber, some of the starch, and some sugars. For, for example, lactose. Lactose in many of us um, escapes digestion if we don't have lots of lactase enzyme. All of this ends up in the colon, destined for breakdown by the microbiota by that anaerobic fermentation. Not very much oxygen down there. Oligosaccharides escape digestion. Most of the prebiotics we hear about are at oligosaccharides. They are these short chain sugars that, um, and here's the definition of the prebiotic, they're selectively utilized by the microorganisms conferring a health benefit. But really the prebiotics are just you know, one of the many types of carbohydrates that end up in the colon to be fermented. And just to mention you know, the common prebiotics, there's FOS, which is fructooligosaccharides, and galacto-oligosaccharides, which is GOS. Um, there's lots of research on 
on those um, oligosaccharides to support them as prebiotics. So what is produced through fermentation? Well, the short chain fatty acids. The short chain fatty acids here, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. If you remember Dr. Archer, when he spoke in our first session, spoke of the benefits of butyrate. Acetate and propionate also have health effects, but more systematic health effects. Like for instance, um, there may be an impact on, on appetite, that sort of thing. And all of them provide some calories once they're absorbed into the body. With fermentation, gases are also produced. For a balanced microbiota, what we need is lots of fermentable carbohydrates, so we get lots of these healthful short-chain fatty acids produced. However, some of the protein we eat also escapes digestion. The more protein we eat, the more goes undigested. Um, protein is also fermented, but when it's fermented, it produces different substances such as ammonia, amines, indols, phenols, branched-chain fatty acids, and some of these um, have harmful inflammatory effects, especially in people like, for instance, that have reduced kidney function. So just in summary, most bacteria prefer to ferment carbohydrate, and most bacteria are car carbohydrate fermenting, but there's also high numbers of these proteolytic bacteria that uh, ferment um, protein and amino acids, but there's also what are known as crossfeeders. Um, these are the bacteria that are able to utilize um, products that are produced by the carbohydrate and the protein fermenters. So what, what has become known as micro, microbial available carbohydrates. So that's the dietary fiber, some starch, some sugars, all of that um, that gets to the colon is perhaps the most important determinant of microbiota composition and its metabolic activity. Greater than 95% of short chain fatty acids are absorbed in the gut and utilized by the body. So how much fiber are we providing our gut microbiota? Well, here in the US, the average American is consuming about 17, maybe 18 grams of fiber, much less than the recommendations. And of course, this is due to our low intake of whole grains, legumes, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. Most American children similarly are consuming um, not enough fiber, but they're consuming even less, um, less than 14 grams of fiber a day. So um, that's probably not news to any of you. So let's take a closer look at what feeds our microbiota. So as I just mentioned, we know that there's about 17 grams of fiber from plant cell walls that gets to the colon. Most of the starch we consume is digested, but there is something called resistant starch. That is the starch that's not digested. And there's a number of different forms of resistant starch. Starch that is trapped in st starch granules. And here's a picture here of these, um, these starch granules of raw potato um, is not digested. But once it gets to the colon, the bacteria can actually get at it. There's also what's known as physically inaccessible starch. And that would be what is found in like raw oat flakes. And, and other cereal grains. So that if, if you compare this, the starch in the oat milk is likely 100% digested, but some of the starch in the raw oat flakes will escape digestion. We also consume, like for instance, added fibers in many, food, many foods these days, but also protein. Protein, about 12 to 18 grams per day of protein goes undigested and gets to the colon. And so that's about the same amount of fiber. And so we have this, this balance, really, of protein getting to the colon and fiber um, because we have such a low fiber diet, um, they're competing, competing to be fermented. So there's lots of other compounds that get to the colon, which we really don't have enough time today to discuss, such as polyphenols uh, that, that are metabolized by the microbiota. So what does the research say about fiber and microbiota? So diets higher in fiber are associated with an increased diversity. There is also an increase in relevant, uh, relative abundance of prevotella. And we're gonna hear more about this. This is thought to be um, a, a healthy balance of microbiota when there is a, there's high levels of, of the prevotella. So fiber, um, if we look at the review of all the clinical trials that have been done, uh, 
it's been shown that the, there's an increase in relative abundance of the bifidobacteria, the lactobacillus, compared to lower fiber or placebo. However, most of the studies actually tested those prebiotics, the ones I talked about, like the FOS and the, and the GOS, the fructans, galacto-oligosaccharides, and haven't tested much of the complex fiber. And so that's why we've seen the higher higher levels of bifidobacteria because prebiotics tend to enhance uh, bifidobacteria numbers and, and in some cases lactobacillus. We know that resistant starch um, and polydextrose, which is an added fiber, increases potentially beneficial butyrate producers such as ruminococcus species. So there's other healthy, healthy bacteria in our gut um, beyond bifidobacteria and lactobacillus. Actually, bifidobacteria and lactobacillus um, especially in adults, is, are in pretty low numbers, especially lactobacillus. Most people have pretty low numbers of lactobacillus. So some additional research. So increased bifidobacterium and lactobacillus have been seen with whole grain intake, higher whole grain intake in children and adults, uh, increased butyrate producers with pistachio and almond intake, suppression of potential protein fermented bacterial groups with so chickpea and and remember we want to we want to suppress those protein fermenters because they produce like ammonia and all of those other compounds that may be detrimental to health so um, an increase in the fed calibacterium prosnitsi which might be one of those indicator organisms has been seen with increasing whole grain intake so what is the best fiber for enhancing the microbiotic composition and I wouldn't pick any of them. I actually would pick all of them, a mix of all of them. I mentioned that prebiotics are specific. So they enhance, uh, for example, bifidobacteria and perhaps a few other bacteria. But dietary fiber in foods, um, it's much more complex than a single type of prebiotic. Dietary fiber comes in a variety of structures such as cellulose, pectins, um, beta-glucan, and many more structures. Um, to be able to break down all of those different carbohydrate structures, many enzymes from different microbes are needed. And so the more diverse the carbohydrate structures you consume, or the more um, diverse the fibers you consume, uh, to make it more clear, the more diverse set of microbes uh, that you'll end up having. And so lower fiber intakes, we, we know have been linked to lower bacterial diversity and an increased risk of disease. Complex fiber sources like whole grains may increase diversity, especially when um, people start out with low baseline diversity, but purified isolated fibers may not have an impact on diversity. Um, that may be partly due to the stability of the microbiota, but also because they're, they're just selectively fermented, they may, they're, they may not only need one enzyme to break them down versus many. So complex dietary fibers may promote increased diversity due to their complex carbohydrate structures and requiring lots of en enzymes uh, for fermentation. So high protein diets are, are still big. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about high protein diets. Um, how does a high protein diet impact microbiota? So we asked this question, we fed a group of women a high protein diet, and um, these rings are actually the microbiota uh, results. Um, so they're, they're a little bit complex, but I, I think they're actually pretty cool looking. So the inner ring is bacteria, the next ring is um, the phyla, and then it goes class, order, and then the outside is the genus that we, we've talked about, the different genus. Um, and this is a group average. And so, a, the first one here, this was um, on their usual diet, then they went on a high protein diet, and then they went back to their usual diet, okay? And so I'm gonna ask this question, does it look very different on the high protein diet compared to the usual diet? So we could look back and forth, but, um, and I can't see the chat box, but I expect um, most of you are gonna say, it kind of looks pretty close to the same, there may be some small changes. And so what changes did we, we see? Um, when people went on a high protein diet, that was about 30% of energy from protein. Um, we didn't see much. We saw less rosberia, and rosberia are plant fiber fermenters. And so that makes sense. If you're having a bit more um, protein foods, you may be eating less plant foods. So the high protein diet also had higher lactococcus. Um, and we figured that was probably from eating cheese because some cheese has lactococcus in it. 
Um, they had higher lactobacillus when they were eating the high protein diet because we gave them yogurt. So some of that lactobacillus from the yogurt is going to end up in the microbiota. So, um, so the high protein diet it, as a group didn't affect the microbiota much. But it, what was really interesting is that responses were individual. So let's look at um, Fecalibacterium, um, that one of those beneficial organisms. So this participant consumed the high protein diet for four two week periods, indicated by the arrows. So went on the high protein diet four different times. Each time the abundance of Fecalibacterium decreased in this participant. So that we would think would be a disadvantage. But if we look at another individual, this individual, again, here's the Fecalibacterium in the bay, brownish beige here. This individual showed no decrease in Fecalibacterium on the high protein diet. Actually, the high protein diet seemed to kind of jumpstart the bifidobacteria because you can see at the beginning, didn't have a green uh, bar at all in the top 20 and then had quite a bit throughout the rest. Roseberia, we'll go back to that one, that, that plant fermenter, it's in the dark pink. They're thought to be beneficial. And note how each high protein um, period, um, the levels are lower. And then when they go back on to their usual diet, um, that pink one goes up. So the take home message here is that the response of the microbiota may be very individual to dietary changes depending on the microbes you have. So let's take a quick look at the research. Um, first, the high fat diet. So there's been a couple of clinical trials that have looked at very high fat diets. The first was a small short term study, which put someone put actually, I think it was nine young men on an animal sourced diet, which was 70% of energy from fat, 30% from protein and no carbohydrate. And not surprisingly, that decreased the abundance of rosberia. We've heard that a number of times and some other plant fermenters. And it increased what are called the bile tolerant bacteria because of course with fat digestion, we have high levels of bile um, needed. And so those bacteria changed. There was another study of young adults and they put them on a lower fat, moderate fat, and a higher fat diet. The higher fat diet was at 40% fat, and they looked at the microbiota over a six month period. So the lower fat diet increased diversity, which is a good thing, uh, and relative abundance of blatia, but also that fecali bacterium that we've heard about already. The higher fat diet was similar to the first clinical study. It increased those bile tolerant bacteria. So. So it may have some disadvantages to that type of diet. What about the Western style dietary pattern? Well, uh, there hasn't actually been a lot of studies looking at just simply uh, you know, a typical Western style diet that we would consume here in the US. Uh, but, it, but this study in community dwelling men, um, this diet was associated with, again, those bile tolerant ones. So that allostipes was one of those bile tolerant ones. And, and that increased in abundance and some of the others. The prudent diet, which we, which we would consider as a healthier diet with more plant-based foods, was associated with an increased relative abundance of the fecali bacterium and a, and a number of other organisms. We really don't know the health effects of most of these differences. We know quite a bit about the fecali bacterium, but we really don't know about the health effects of some of these other organisms. What about the Mediterranean diet? So there's been a couple of studies, um, the not, a non-interventional study. So this just looked at people that were already consuming the diet, either as an omnivore, vegetarian, or vegan, and they were following the Mediterranean diet. And so when they looked just comparing the omnivores, the vegetarians, and vegans, there's no differences between, um, or nothing really came up as a difference in the microbiota. The only thing that they actually found is they found um, these fiber degraders to be higher with a higher diet quality. There is also an interventional trial in overweight and obese individuals and um, the Mediterranean diet increased. Again, here we see the fecali bacteria and prosnid, see that butyrate producer increasing with the Mediterranean diet. 
So with vegetarian vegan diets, plant-based foods um, typically provide, we know, provide higher levels of fiber and are generally lower in protein than an omnivore diet. And so we would figure that that, would, that balance would favor carbohydrate, which we want, versus protein fermentation. So there is a systematic review and they found no associations um, in microbiota between consumers of the vegetarian and vegan diet compared to omnivores. And the reason they, they said that they didn't see a difference is that there's so much individual variability. I mean, my microbiota is so different than yours, even if we were following um, the same type of vegetarian diet, we would have a different set of microbes. Just a couple more diets that we're gonna talk about. The very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, there's been a couple of studies there, a trial in children, and the ketogenic diet is used for intractable epilepsy. And so in this study, they examined the fecal microbiota after the ketogenic and showed a decreased abundance of the firmicutes, which is the dominant phyla, and an increase in abundance of the bacteroides. Whether or not that has real health effects, um, we're unsure. Other trials have found that when people go on these ketogenic diets, it decreases the bifidobacterium um, and also decreases the fecalibacterium and then increases some of these others, like for instance, bacteroids, which is not necessarily considered to be a healthful um, change. So last one, um, paleolithic diet. Um, so the microbiota of adults consuming a modern paleolithic diet was compared to the microbiota of adults consuming a Mediterranean diet and also to hunters and gatherers. Not a lot of hunters and gatherers left in the world, but the paleolithic diet supported diversity similar to that of hunters and gatherers. Um, so, but also showed a similar response to the high fat interventions. And so here again, are these bile tolerant organisms. So as soon as you start dropping the carbohydrate and fiber content of the diet and instead increasing in, in fat particularly, you end up with those, an increase in those bile tolerant organisms. So in conclusion, uh, consuming a diet with plenty of plant source foods, vegetables, fruits, grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, many of which I would recommend whole or minimally processed, so there's lots of resistant starch and lots of fiber, um, should provide an optimal substrate for the microbiota and the production of the beneficial substances such as the short chain fatty acids. Low carbohydrate, high fat diets, possibly high protein diets without adequate fiber, or a diet high in ultra processed foods. So those would be foods that really are um, devoid of much fiber at all may not support an optimal microbiota. So that's, it's just another good reason to promote a plant-based diet. So here's some key references and I will turn it over to Wendy um, to introduce Dr. Ju. Thanks Dr. Dahl. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Young Ju. Um, Dr. Ju has a PhD from the University of Illinois, Ur Urbana-Champaign. She's an associate professor in the Department of Human Nutrition, Foods, and Exercise at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia, and with a research interest in diet and cancer. And with, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Ju. Thank you. Uh, looks like I cannot share my screen. Okay. Wendy, did you stop sharing your screen? Yes, I did. Okay. Okay. It looks like, there you go, it's, it is up. All right. Let's see. All right. Thank you for inviting me to this continuing education webinar series. Um, I, I guess the previous speakers in September and October and the first speaker have talked about gut microbiota and uh, probiotic bacteria. Today, I'll, I'm going to expand that information a little bit to the fermented food and their health benefits. 
<clears throat> so I'll start with the various types of fermented food, and then I'll talk about several uh, health benefits of uh, fermented food. Fermentation is one of the food preservation techniques. Uh, it's one of the oldest and the most common used food preservation method in the world. And it's an uh, uh, inexpensive process that requires uh, little energy compared to other preservation, food preservation method. The fermentation has multiple roles in food processing. It enriches our diet through development of diverse flavors and aroma and texture in food. And it preserves a substantial amounts of food through lactic acid fermentation, acetic acid uh, fermentation, like a vinegar fermentation, and alkaline fermentation or uh, high salt fermentation. So during the lactic acid fermentation, lactic acid is produced like in yogurt. And then during the acetic acid fermentation, vinegar is produced like in the pickles. In alkaline fermentation, the protein of the food materials is broken down into uh, amino acid and a peptide. So ammonia is released during the fermentation and then uh, reducing acidity of the food product and giving the food a strong ammonia-like smell, so like a natto. And then high salt fermentation uses salt concentration ranging from uh, about five to 20%. And fermentation enhances nutritional quality and also digestibility. So fermentation increases vitamin B and C and vitamin K. And fermentation also increases bioavailability of calcium, phosphorus, and iron and fermentation breaks down proteins and improve digestibility. Fermentation increases a variety of microorganisms, including variety of probiotic uh, bacteria. And many fruits, vegetables, and legumes contain naturally occurring toxins, which cause intestinal discomfort, and also contains anti-nutritional component, which interfere other nutrient absorption into the body. So these toxins and anti-nutrients can be removed and reduced or detoxified uh, by the action of microorganisms during fermentation. And it can decrease cooking time, obviously, and then uh, fewer requirements. So it's a cost-effective way. So fermented foods are defined as food or beverages produced through controlled micro, uh, microbial growth and the conversion of food components through enzymatic action. Fermented foods have been used by humans for thousands of years. In recent years, fermented foods have become more popular, mainly due to their potential health benefits. Every country in every region, on every continent, have a unique dietary habits influenced by their cultures, accessibility to food sources, and then their weather conditions. So these factors have contributed to thousands of different uh, variations of fermented food. For most of human history, fermented foods and alcoholic beverages were produced from plant or animal sources by traditional fermentation also called natural fermentation or spontaneous fermentation, which uses the method where portions of a previously fermented product were added to a fresh material without using a starter culture. And starter cultures, also known uh, or also called the cult culture-dependent fermentation. So using lactic acid bacteria, acetic acid bacteria, yeast, and then fungi that became available in the 20th centuries. And then they are now commonly used in industrial fermentations and including wine, dairy products, and meat products, especially in the Western countries. Fermented food contain probiotic microorganisms in general 
lactic acid bacteria from several genera, including Lactobacillus and Streptococcus and then Leuconostoc. And those are the predominant in dairy product and in fermented meat, fermented cereal, and fermented alcoholic beverages and other uh, the product. But also other bacteria such as a uh, Bifidobacterium and acetic acid bacteria, as well as yeast and the fungi, also found in uh, fermented food. During fermentation, these microorganisms produce their metabolite that may also have a health benefit. And for example, lactic acid bacteria generate bioactive peptides or polyamines with the potential effects on. Uh, cardiovascular health and an immune uh, system and then metabolic health. And during fermentation, these microorganisms may also convert certain food components to biologically active metabolite. For example, lactic acid bacteria can convert phenolic compounds to biologically active metabolites. So there are many different types of fermented foods consumed around the world, including uh, dairy and meat and fish, vegetables and fruits, and the root vegetables and tubers, soybeans and other legumes, cereals and fruits, um, <clears throat> and alcoholic beverages. So let's look into each type. Fermented dairy food are the most widely used carriers of probiotics in Western countries, including cultured milk, also called sour milk, and yogurt, kefir. So kefir is made with kefir grain as a starter culture, and kefir grains are the um, lactose fermenting yeast. And cheese and cheese extract and sour cream and the wheat uh, oil product, those are the examples of the fermented dairy product. And cow's milk is the basis for most fermented dairy products around the world. Still, milk from other animals, including sheep, goat, ewe, camel, horse, buffalo, and a yak uh, may be used in many regions such as the South European countries many Asian countries, African countries, and other Mediterranean countries. Fermented meat has been consumed all over the world, except in religions with a special, uh, I mean, with a special uh, religious practice, such as Buddhism or Hinduism. Whole pieces or uh, slices of meats of various animals are traditionally preserved by smoking or other methods of drying. And fermented meat products include sausages, salami, ham, and pepperoni. So sliced or ground or minced meat and fatty tissue are mixed with salt, spices, and sugar and curing agents like nitrite or nitrate or ascorbate, which is vitamin C and also star cultures. So fermented meat products are very popular and use various ingredients and methods from one culture to another. Fermented fishes, such as shrimp and shellfish, squid, and all kinds of fishes are commonly used in South and Southeast Asian cuisine. And generally high salt fermentation and alkaline fermentation methods are used. Fermented fish products, also fermented fish paste and a fishy sauce are available. And various microorganisms and enzymes from fishes are found in these products and other reactions during fermentation add flavor in fermented fish products. Every country has used fermented vegetable with all kinds of vegetables, including cabbages, cauliflower, cucumber, carrot, garlic, peppers, snap beans, and olives, and kohlrabi, bamboo shoots, and etc. Spontaneous fermentation in salt brine uh, and pickling by acetic acid fermentation are commonly used methods. 
and various microorganisms are found in fermented vegetable and also fermented vegetable juices and fermented teas uh, uh, like the kombucha is available. Fermented fruits are also used in main dishes and dressing and dessert. So berries, citrus fruit, apples, mango, papaya, cherries, figs, bananas are commonly used to fruits. And sugar brine or uh, and or vinegar are used for fruit fermentation. So fermented fruits are often too high in sugars or acid. And fermented fruit juices and teas are also available. Apple cider vinegar uh, is created from apples and sugar and yeast. And apple cider vinegar is also used as a starter in other fermented food. Fermented root vegetables are high in prebiotics. So prebiotics are certain carbohydrates which are the food for probiotic bacteria such as resistant starch and follicular oligosaccharide. So humans have been fermenting root crops for over thousands of years, including ginger, turmeric, yams, and sunchokes, uh, ginseng, bellflower roots, and rotus root, radishes, and turnip, parsnip, rutabag, and then uh, cassava, and etc. In the, the fermented juice, such as uh, uh, sweet potato uh, processed by lactic acid fermentations are also available. So fresh root crops contain naturally containing toxins. Fermentation may reduce these toxins. For example, um, cassava, so linamarin is the major toxin found in cassava. So linamarin is converted by enzymatic reaction to toxic cyanide. And during lactic acid fermentation, cyanide content of cassava is reduced. Beans and legumes are excellent source of plant-based protein. And beans and legumes are also contains allergens, food allergen, food allergen protein, which cause allergenic reaction, and also contain toxins, which cause intestinal discomfort, and an anti-nutrient, which interferes other nutrient absorption. So fermentation could reduce contents of these compounds. And fermented soybean product include the soybean paste like a miso, and then soy sauce, and then tempeh, uh, which is a traditional uh, Indonesian um, the food product, and natto, which is a traditional Japanese food product, uh, fermented with a bacillus species, and then fermented tofu, that's a traditional Chinese food made from fresh tofu, in salt brine with a rice wine and other flavoring. And then uh, fermented soy milk is prepared with a lactic acid bacteria as a starter. Cereal grains are one of the most important sources of proteins and carbohydrates and vitamins and mineral and fiber. And traditional fermented foods in many parts of the world are prepared from most common types of cereals such as rice, wheat, corn, or sorghum. And lactic acid bacteria are commonly used as a starter uh, for grain cereal fermentation. And they contribute to improve aroma and flavor and they reduce the anti uh, nutrient like phytic acid activity and thereby improving bioavailability of minerals such as iron and produce uh, certain vitamins, including B vitamins. And fermented grain tea and beverages are also available. Cocoa beans and coffee beans are, are seeds, not exactly the cereal grain, but I just included it in this slide. So the pulp surrounding cocoa beans and coat in uh, the coffee bean they are fermented by various microorganisms, including yeast, lactic acid bacteria, and acetic acid bacteria. So both cocoa and coffee fermentation process add flavors and sensory characteristics. And then last food group, alcohol. 
So that those are produced using yeast or spontaneous fermentation. And beer is typically made from barley or a blend of grains and flavored with hops. And the wine is produced from grapes and other fruits. And mead is by fermenting honey with water, sometimes with various fruits and spices and grains and hops. And cider is made from any fruit juice. So apple juice is traditionally and most commonly used one. And uh, rice wine is produced using yeast fermentation. So in the annual was trending in nutrition survey, over uh, 1,300 registered dietitian nutritionists responded that the fermented foods are the top food for 2019. They were in 2018. And according to the data essentials, uh, fall 2018 menu trend, over the past four years, the term fermented was included more by 46% uh, on the U.S. restaurant menu. And kombucha was included more by 226%, uh, kefir by 101%, kimchi by 92%, and pickled by 55%. And according to the Hartman Group uh, 2019 Health and Wellness Report, uh, about 39% of the consumers responded, uh, adding more probiotics to their diet. So these changes indicate consumers' perception toward the fermented food. However, there are not enough data available addressing fermented food consumption in the U.S. And one observational study as a part of the American Gut Project, by the way, the American Gut Project was launched in 2012 as a, a collaboration between the Earth Microbiome Project and the Human Food Project. So this 2020 study assessed an association between fermented plant food intake and gut microbiome response. So, among uh, 6,811 surveyed participants, about 30.5% of them were self-reported as uh, fermented plant food consumers. Among these consumers, 21.6% uh, of them reported that they are uh, consuming every day. And 32.4% of them consume regularly, which is three to five times a week. And then, um, the 45% three, I mean 45%, 3.3% of them responded occasionally, which is one or two times a week. So this study also found that fermented plant food consumption was slightly higher in women. So 56.8% uh, uh, of women and then 52.6% of men responded as a consumer. And then fermented plant food consumption was higher in younger uh, age group with the um, 30s being the highest. And then it was higher in people with the normal BMI. And when they analyzed the stool samples, they detected higher level of, uh, levels of lactic acid bacteria and the fermented food derived microorganisms in the stool samples from uh, fermented plant uh, food consumers. However, there was no difference in total calorie intake and in dietary fiber intake and protein intake. So, although uh, fermented food has have been used a part of a human diet for thousands of years, with a few exceptions, fermented food are not included as a recommended category of food in dietary guidelines. So the dietary guidelines for Indians recommend eat more whole grains and sprouted grains and fermented food. And then the guidelines also describe the enhanced digestibility of fermented food and increased nutritional value through greater production of vitamins B and C. And the Chinese Nutrition Society suggests the use of yogurt for those who do not tolerate milk and then in Canada and the USA, 
the food guides have yogurt and kefir as recommended items listed under the uh, dairy products section. But uh, there is no emphasis on them being fermented food, nor uh, there is inclusion of fermented food as a healthy category. So fermented foods are rich in provided bacteria and nutrients. And so consuming fermented foods may add the beneficial bacteria and enzymes to overall intestinal flora, increasing the health of a gut microbiome and digestive system and further affecting immune system and metabolic disease and brain health. So let's look into some research findings related to these health benefits. And researchers have investigated the effect of fermented food using cell culture studies and animal studies and human studies. I only included human trials and meta-analysis in this presentation, except few animal studies in brain health. And there are also other reported benefits on bone health or hormone balance or kidney and liver health and dental health, but we, we are not going to talk about them today. So the main benefit of fermented food consumption is improving gastrointestinal health. And meta-analysis and clinical trials have shown that fermented milk and yogurt and fermented soy milk and fermented tea modulated microbiota composition and increased the probiotic microbiota, uh, microorganism. And there are many more studies showing microbiota modulation. I just listed a few in this slide. And the one study showing that kefir uh, consumption relieved the symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease, including uh, the bowel movement and in gastrointestinal discomfort. So inflammatory bowel disease is a disease which can cause uh, destructive inflammation and permanent damage to the intestine. And another meta-analysis found uh, fermented milk, yogurt, sauerkraut, and uh, wheat bread and pasta made with a sourdough lactic acid bacteria relieved the symptoms of um, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, reduced depression and anxiety, and improved the quality of life. While irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease have some similar symptoms, they are two different gastrointestinal disorder. Irritable bowel syndrome is a group of symptoms, unlike uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, the irritable bowel syndrome does not cause inflammation, rarely require the hospitalization or surgery. And usually there is no sign of disease or abnormality during the colon exam and then no increased risk for colon cancer or uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Another clinical trial shows the fermented milk and yogurt and uh, fermented rice, um, the, the fermented with the lactic acid bacteria prevent the pathogenic infections in children. Another health benefits of a fermented food consumption is improving immune function. The immunomodulatory role of a probiotic bacteria has been investigated in several aspects of immune system function and in different infectious disease. A review uh, of 16 human studies found that the consumption of fermented dairy product is associated with the anti-inflammatory effect by reducing inflammatory markers, including C-reactive protein, and also increasing anti-inflammatory cytokine levels in the blood and increasing immune cell numbers. And one clinical trial, the long-term <clears throat> the long-term effect of yogurt consumption on two different age groups, young adult and senior adult. And one year consumption of yogurt can reduce some of the clinical symptoms of atopic uh, rhinitis or nasal allergies in both age group and can lower the serum uh, level of immunoglobulin E, particularly among the elderly population. So for about the immunoglobulin E, if you have an allergy, your immune system reacts to the food allergen or allergen 
uh, by producing immunoglobulin E. So food allergens are protein, which usually uh, the large in size and not digested properly. So during fermentation, some food allergen protein are broken down into smaller sizes and their digestibility will be improved. And lactic acid bacteria supplemented the yogurt, um, increased the uh, uh, interferon gamma in asthmatic adults. The interferon gamma is a cytokine um, which is critical to both innate and adaptive immunity and uh, functions as a primary activator of immune cells. And uh, also one review found the regular yogurt and probiotic bacteria supplemented yogurt improved the lactose digestion and uh, reduced the lactose intolerance symptoms. During the last several years, research studies investigated the uh, effects of fermented foods on the metabolic disorders. And a metabolic disorder occurs when the metabolism process fails and causes a chemical imbalance. And metabolic risk factors include the hypotension and hyperlipidemia and hyperglycemia and then obesity, not limited to. So these are the um, the commonly used risk marker for metabolic disease. In the clinical trial and in reviews, fermented milk reduced both systolic and diastolic blood pressure in hypertensive people. And fermented milk and uh, kefir also lowered the triglyceride and in uh, low density lipoprotein cholesterol uh, level in the people with the hyperlipidemia. And kefir and yogurt and probiotic supplemented the yogurt and fermented tea uh, improved the glycemic control in type 2 diabetic patients by reducing hemoglobin A1C level and fasting glucose levels in these patients. And in type 2 uh, diabetic patients with obesity, the yogurt consumption reduced weight gain. But uh, for this study, they did not see the changes in hemoglobin A1C level and glucose level, only changes in body weight. And in obese subject, and fermented tea reduced the body weight gain. The, um, another uh, promising benefit of a fermented food is their impact on brain health. Uh, there is a growing body of evidence that uh, the intestinal microbiota influences the gut and brain interactions in different points of life, from early life to the later neurodegeneration, as well as at different systems like a gastrointestinal system to central nervous system. However, very limited numbers of clinical trials are available. So the consumption of fermented milk improve the cognitive functions of the elderly people. So cognitive function refers multiple mental abilities, including learning, thinking, reasoning, remembering, problem solving, and decision making, and attention, and etc. And the consumption of a soy-based fermented food improved the memory and cognitive function of middle-aged people, but not of the elderly people. And the amyloid beta is a brain protein fragment that accumulates in the brain, disturbing uh, the communication between cells, brain cells, and eventually destroying those cells. So amyloid beta plaque in the brain may be a marker of Alzheimer's disease. However, a brain scan of Alzheimer's patients is not an accurate nor the uh, effective method for uh, measuring sev severity of Alzheimer's uh, disease. So therefore, Alzheimer's animal models are used. In Alzheimer's disease, mice model, rice vinegar uh, reduced amyloid beta deposit in their brain. And fermented ginseng also reduced amyloid beta form uh, formation in the Alzheimer's disease mice model. And also in the Alzheimer's disease mice, uh, rice vinegar reduced oxidative stress, which is another major contributing factor to neurodegenerative disease. 
So fermented foods are considered safe for most people. However, some individuals may experience adverse effects. The most common adverse effect is a temporary um, bloating due to the uh, high probiotic content. So taking a small portion could reduce the bloating issue. And fermented foods contain uh, biogenic amines such as histamine and tyramine. And amines are produced by certain bacteria to break down the amino acid in fermented food. And people who are sensitive to these amines may experience headaches and migraines uh, after eating fermented food. And some fermented product may contain high levels of added salt or sugar. So if an individual who are on low sodium diet or low sugar diet, uh, uh, they have to monitor salt and sugar intake. And observational studies found an association between habitual fermented fish sauce consumption and an increased risk of uh, esophageal cancer. So fermented fishes and fermented meat contain high amount of uh, um, n nitrous compound, which are known animal carcinogen. Okay. So how much of fermented food do we need to take to obtain those health benefits? And unfortunately, we don't know because each fermented food contains different spectrum of a probiotic bacteria and nutrient. And each fermented food is kept in a different storage condition and they undergo different duration of a fermentation, which also affect bacteria and bacterial and nutritional composition. And for example, one serving of sauerkraut from a jar opened today and a week before do not contain the same amount of microorganisms and nutrients. So no recommended dietary allowance for fermented food or probiotic is established. What we could do is to take a different types of fermented food instead of relying on few sources. I know most of research studies, they use a, a dairy product, but there are a whole bunch of other types of fermented food. In this way, we can get diverse probiotic bacteria and nutrition, nutrient, and also try small portions to avoid the uh, adverse effects. In summary, Fermentation is a cost-effective food preservation of animal and plant food sources that has been used for thousands of years. And during food fermentation, numbers and types of probiotic bacteria and other microorganisms are increased, and certain nutrient levels are increased. Toxins and anti-nutrients are reduced, and digestibility is improved. And research evidence suggests Fermented foods have the potential to modify the composition of the intestinal microbiota, which has been shown to be altered in several diseases in the human host. And through restoring the intestinal microbiota balance and impacting on the function of the immune system, altering on the contribution factors to metabolic disease and impacting on the function of the brain. However, there are limited numbers of well-designed studies. Most of these studies were tested fermented dairy product. So therefore, it's necessary to investigate the effects of other popular fermented food in diverse health conditions. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you so much, Dr. Ju. Um, and I don't know if we still have questions, Kendra. Are there any? I know we're a little over time, so thank you guys for hanging in there with us for this great information. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, Dr. Ju, there were a couple of questions about um, what counts as fermented foods. I think you covered pickled foods, but would you consider buttermilk uh, fermented milk? Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, I guess so. 
Yeah. And then uh, it uses uh, sometimes a starter culture and uh, both spontaneous fermentation. Yeah. Okay. And is fermented tea the same as kombucha? Mm hmm. Okay. That's the uh, uh, um, black tea, which is the fermented uh, green tea. Okay. But often it contains a very high uh, dose of sugar. Okay, and so from um, from your presentation and the research that you presented, is buttermilk a good thing for older adults? Well, buttermilk, there are a few buttermilk studies out there and uh, they, they have a mixed result because some uh, elderly population, their cholesterol level got increased. So uh, we cannot make a, a conclusive statement, buttermilk will be helpful. Okay, and then um, are, are there recommendations for introducing fermented foods to babies? Well, their gut flora is not fully developed until uh, one or two years. So uh, after that, uh, introducing fermented food, food product will be okay. But if you look at the different cu culture and different countries, babies and then uh, toddlers, uh, they are consuming similar food uh, the adults are consuming. And then uh, they have a research outcome showing it can reduce the, uh, the allergic reaction like a skin allergy or uh, nasal allergy. So. Okay, excellent. Uh, and the last two questions that we have um, are related to kombucha. Uh, are beverages like kombucha uh, from stores active and as healthy as, as homemade? Well, uh, again, it's a fermented tea, but uh, uh, one major concern for kombucha is the high sugar level. So if you made that at home and use less amount of sugar, um, maybe healthier than the one you're buying from the store. So yeah, major issue is sugar content. Okay, that's good to know. What does the latest research on kombucha say? Um, this, I think Hunter had read some studies that it's not as, a, as, a, as effective as it was once thought to be a few years ago for gut health. Could you repeat that question again? Sure. Uh, what does the latest research on kombucha say? Uh, one of the individuals, one of the participants said that he had read some studies that, it, that kombucha is not as effective as it was once thought to be a few years ago. Oh, you, you mean the, related to the weight gain? Uh, for, who, yeah, he was talking about gut health. So I'm not sure, you, I think you talked about it in a few different places, so. Well, the, I didn't include any kombucha research in, in this slide because uh, kombucha outcomes are kind of mixed. Some of them are uh, telling it modifies the gut microbiota, but uh, if it's consumed in diabetic uh, population actually didn't affect the glucose level. And some study tested in uh, uh, hypertensive people, it reduced only systolic blood pressure so it's not consistent. That's why I didn't include that one. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for two really great presentations. There were a lot of questions. Dr. Dahl, I think, answered all of hers in the chat box. So I hope everybody that hung with us uh, learned lots of really great information. Thank you.